Hey there, Digital World. Welcome back once again to another episode of Spliced In Later. I hope you all have had a good week over the last week. Uh, plenty of movies to see, plenty of movies reviewed here on Spliced In Later. I wonder if you saw any of them. Looking at the box office, maybe you saw one of them, but probably not the others. That's okay, plenty more movies to come. Uh, a bit of a break from reviews though this week, and as such we are going to tackle uh, a more recent series of episodes once again looking into the movies from Christopher Nolan hopefully getting them all out of the way before Oppenheimer premieres on July 19th or July 20 depending where you are in the world and what's available to you which is in about four weeks time so to give you my layout of what's coming we've got our episode today uh, next week will be a review of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny a week after that the final Christopher Nolan episode. Week after that, a Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 review. And then the showdown. Which will I see first, Barbie or Oppenheimer? It's probably going to be Barbie, which I'm fine with. Uh, but should all work out. We should get through all that, which I'm sure all of you are anxious for me to do. <laughs> and if you're not, that's okay. Thank you for listening anyway. So... Uh, getting right into it, I don't know how long this episode will be because where we're up to for Christopher Nolan right now, we will be talking about Inception today. And through a variety of different episodes, I have kind of already addressed this movie a bit. Whether it's quite recently in my top 10 movies of 2010, where Inception ranked quite highly on that list, uh, to discussing it in other more sci-fi related discussions or even in tandem with other Christopher Nolan discussions, it's been there. It's been in the circumference of it all. So I feel like I would be repeating myself to really go into it again. If you do want some more extensive Inception stuff, feel free to have a look around at the other stuff. I've got plenty in my library for you to listen to. A shameless plug, if you will, to check out my other content. But it's also a very big, important part of the timeline and trajectory of Christopher Nolan getting as big and famous as he is because today's episode is primarily focused as well on why Christopher Nolan uh, of all people of all directors is such a box office draw why does Hollywood and cinemas and everywhere look at an upcoming Christopher Nolan film heading their way and going if the stars align that movie is gonna bring us in a ton of money at the box office we'll give him as much money as he needs because the results are going to be huge now, you could argue that's not always 100% the case, but I would argue, I think it is. You have to take in some factors that are influencing things going on, such as COVID-19, uh, how much money goes into the project, how much comes out, the amount of movies that Christopher Nolan has made in relation to, say, James Cameron. Yes, Avatar The Way of Water was a huge success, but it was a 13-year in the making movie. Uh, in that time, Nolan has probably made four or five movies of probably the same epic scale and of also the same quality in my opinion so potato tomato you know but we'll look into that because as we are trajectorying his rise to this point when we began he was just an independent little director who was making tiny little movies like memento slowly gaining some traction when he releases insomnia and the prestige and then hits it big with his Dark Knight trilogy, the Batman story starring Christian Bale and Heath Ledger's Joker, arguably the best interpretation of the Batman world, although I would argue the most recent Batman probably gives it a run for its money easily, uh, but definitely one of the greatest performances in cinema with Heath Ledger's Joker. Now one could say, okay, so the Dark Knight is the reason why Christopher Nolan became as big as he was. And I would say, yeah, okay, maybe, but I have to give it to Inception here because behind Batman, behind the Dark Knight is what we're going to address quite near, right, right now <laughs> is IP brand and how the IP brand factors into modern day cinema these days and success of the box office. The, the battle between original ideas and recognizable media. So getting to that in a minute though, I would argue then that Inception was the true proof that Christopher Nolan could give an original idea and get the same box office results as he got with the Batman movies, thereby giving him the trust from Hollywood, from actors, from everybody involved, that he could go bigger, 
more extreme with his ideas, more insane, and still reap the benefits of his creativity. My cat's taking a shit. So if you hear him burying it in the litter box, uh, I guess you can add that to your ASMR. Boy, does he love doing a poop <laughs> when I'm trying to record. Uh, but you know what? He's already got into it. A, bit, a lot of it's already in the background here. We may as well just roll with it. I hope it's not a stinker. So, Inception paves the way for Nolan to do Interstellar, Dunkirk, Tenant stuff we're going to address in our last episode. Now, what this leans into is why was Christopher Nolan so successful and continues to be so successful when we live in a world where the age of the movie star is dead and by essence, the movie director as well. Back in the the past of cinema, the 40s to the 90s, maybe even the 2000s as well, the big draw of people going to the movies was to see movie stars, not necessarily what the movies were about. There was no anticipation like, I can't wait for that, they, when they finally make that movie about a president who fights terrorists on a plane, or I can't wait for the movie where uh, this guy is on the run from the law and he has to clear his name. Uh, back then, it was, I can't wait for the next Harrison Ford movie. Harrison Ford, I'll see anything he's in because he's a star. Not just Harrison Ford, you know, way back as far as Humphrey Bogart and Marlon Brando. I mean, especially Humphrey Bogart. Back with Casablanca, people would talk about, you going to the movies? I'm going to go see the new Humphrey Bogart picture. What's it about? I don't know, but Humphrey Bogart's in it, so I'm going to go see it. And even in recent years, one could argue uh, Brad Pitt, uh, Johnny Depp in the past, Tom Cruise, Tom Hanks, Sandra Bullock, and Julia Roberts for some female examples as well there. Nowadays, things have changed. And I would argue everybody listening to this to really have a think and go, when was the last time you went to go see a movie without any idea what it was about? You hadn't seen any trailers, you hadn't heard any buzz. You were just going to go see it because uh, Tom Holland's in it or uh, Florence Pugh, uh, all the up and coming stars now. Do you go to the movies because they are the, they are the stars without any real concern about what it's about? You just wanna see them in a movie? Or do you go to the movies because they are telling movies about things that you recognize, you remember, the nostalgia, the recognition, the IP brand. That unfortunately is what Hollywood is. And I say that unfortunately knowing full well that I contribute to it. Most of the time when a new year rolls around and I make my little list of what movies are coming out for the year, 95% of what I write down to remember to see are things that I know from previous things, whether it's sequels to previous movies or prequels or reboots or spin-offs uh, or brand new stuff that's based on a particular IP brand. Maybe it's a TV show that's being put into a movie. Maybe it's a live action retelling of a Disney animated classic. Uh, maybe it's six different Marvel Cinematic movies, which are part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, therefore have to go see them. On the flip side, you've also got DC as well. Even stuff that I don't know personally, I often will write down because I'm aware of that brand. When I've gone to see Sonic the Hedgehog or the Super Mario Bros movie, I don't have much of a memory of playing those as a kid. I don't know the characters. I couldn't tell you anything about whether the movies are being authentic to their characters. But when I see Mario go, Mamma Mia, I go, hey, it's the Mario game, I'll go see it. Or when Sonic the Hedgehog says, gotta go fast, I go, it's Sonic, I'll go see it. Even upcoming Barbie, you take away how awesome the movie already looks with the trailer and with Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling. And I think even then I'd hear, there's a Barbie movie? I know Barbie, Barbie was those dolls. I'll go see it. I never had a Barbie as a kid. I kind of wish I did, but I never did. But I recognize Barbie. It sets off endorphins in my brain of my youth. When I was young and Barbies were everywhere. Therefore, I'll go see the movie because of that. Very rarely do you hear, hey, um, 
Jake Gyllenhaal's in a movie. What's it about? Don't know. But uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's in it. Let's go see it. And for any other sort of actor as well. And the same can be said for directors. Uh, you know, the, the Ridley Scotts of this world. Those poor guys who desperately make these movies and just cannot capture that box office success that they had when they released Alien or Blade Runner back in the day. Why? They're, they're still talented directors. Are they doing anything differently? Probably not. It's just the climate of the cinema industry now. No one goes, the new Ridley Scott's movie's coming. The one where he's, it's about uh, old timey people with swords. Uh, no, I'd rather go see the fifth Ghostbusters instead. However, there are a few exceptions to the rule. Not a lot, but there are a few directors that still seem to have a box office draw, a pull that people want to see movies that they make without any association to an IP brand. Uh, some others that come to mind besides Christopher Nolan, Quentin Tarantino. He doesn't make a lot of movies, but when they come out, people are highly anticipating them, even though they don't know a lot of what's actually coming. They're just like, it's the new Tarantino movie. I want to go see it. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, incredibly long movie, a huge love letter to Hollywood of the past. Not really something that every average Joe wants to see, somehow still did remarkably well. And also, bloody fantastic movie. Uh, I guess you could argue James Cameron. It's kind of a cheat because he doesn't release a movie every 13 years, but there is that understanding that when you go see a James Cameron movie, you're probably going to see something you've never seen before. So it's less, oh, what number avatar is this? And more, I want to see James Cameron's directing skills. Uh, even Martin Scorsese, uh, he hasn't released a film in the cinemas for a while. There is one coming out this year, but even his uh, outlet on streaming, The Irishman on Netflix, a bloody three and a half hour film. People will watch it because it's Martin Scorsese. You know when you watch a Martin Scorsese film, you're going to have great dialogue, interesting characters, and a very engaging, suck you in story. But they are exceptions. These days you get your Ridley Scotts, uh, your, your Guy Ritchie's, uh, few other few other examples that I can't really think of right now, but very rare is it like that new movie's coming out by that director. Christopher Nolan is included in the Tarantino camp. So much so that during the height of the pandemic, uh, when all the movies shut down, everything was constantly being delayed, no movies were coming out, Hollywood and cinemas put everything behind Christopher Nolan's Tenant, the his newest movie, to be the thing that saves cinemas and bring people back to the theaters. It did not work. Uh, but the fact that they actually believed that would be the case at a point when COVID was still running rampant through the world and everybody was too scared as hell to go outside and sit next to strangers in a theater. The fact that they looked at the movies that they had and went, Tenant, Tenant's the one that's gonna do it, says a lot about the confidence behind him. But why? Why is Christopher Nolan's movies a box office draw. And I think what it comes down to is they are incredibly engaging. Even if you don't understand what's going on, there are a lot of fun. There are a lot of intriguing uh, ideas coming in front of you, a lot of recognizable actors, and things are constantly happening in a Nolan film. There's not a lot of sitting down and talking and discussing feelings. There's crazy ideas, crazy concepts, and he runs with it. And yes, sometimes the movies get a bit long, but not all the time. Dunkirk is blessedly short, has a very wacky time distortion of storylines. I think it could be one of his best movies. But it was Inception that proved that this was a direction Hollywood could take with him and that he had success ahead of him. Before that, he had all his independent stuff, maybe not independent with the prestige or insomnia, but on the smaller scale. He gets big with The Dark Knight, but as I said, it's an IP brand. People were also going to see those movies because they're Batman and they like Batman. Maybe not necessarily Christopher Nolan's direction, they just enjoy seeing Batman on screen. So Inception, an original idea, comes out for him in 2010. 
It's a unique Pluramus. It stars Leonardo DiCaprio as Dom Cobb, uh, living in a world where he is on the run for reasons that we do not know. He is pretty much not allowed to go back to America and see his children. But he has this sort of on the down low job where he's hired by rich people, criminals, whatever you want to literally infiltrate people's minds via their dreams and extract information, whether it's uh, codes or info that can help topple stock markets, however you want to do it. He does this by assembling a team of people with certain skills that can navigate the dream world to find things, take them out of people's subconscious, all the while surviving a pretty harrowing experience. What happens in Inception is Ken Watanabe, a very rich man, comes to him and says, I will find a way for you to return to America and be with your children, because apparently being super rich means I can just make sure crime is not a problem for you. But instead of an extraction, I want you to do something that's never been done before. It's an inception. I need you to go into a target's dreams and plant an idea, not extract information, but plant something in their subconscious that will make them do something. It's for a noble cause. Like the rich guy isn't going, make him kill himself or anything. Uh, it's it's something that needs to be done that benefits him, but is also an emotional catharsis for the target of this inception. Cobb, of course, wants to see his children again. He gets together a group of wacky characters played by Elliot Page, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Tom Hardy, and they go down into these dreams to do the task. However, two plants and inception, to inception someone, if you will, requires going very deep into their subconscious, which means going through different layers of dreams. And going back to what I've mentioned with Nolan's previous work, he loves his unreliable narrator and distortion of time to tell stories. Each layer operates at a different speed. So by the time you get down to the third layer, things that you do that take up to put in your preference to be an hour, up on the top level, it's only been four seconds. So they have to go deeper and deeper and deeper, avoiding the security of the subconscious, which is the target's uh, security force who notice that something in a dream is not how it's supposed to be. So actively target them. This is in a world as well where people know that people infiltrate other people's dreams so they can do special courses to protect their brains. All the while dealing with com comms, <laughs> cobs, tragic past where uh, he used to run around the dream world with his wife but she went cuckoo bananas and killed herself because she thought the real world was a dream so in his subconscious he has like a psychotic manifestation of her that is constantly taunting him and basically trying to break his mind by the end of the movie uh, it has the infamous ending where Cobb does reunite with his children we don't really know if he's dreaming or if he's awake, but the whole point of the movie is not that he's dreaming or not, it's that he doesn't care. So there that is. An incredible movie. I've mentioned it a lot in all the other times I've talked about, it, so I don't need to go on about why it's good and all of that. Uh, I think the box office results for itself, the fact that it is included in a lot of people's top movies of the 2010s, uh, movies of all time, very high on specific Christopher Nolan rankings, favorite performances from actors like DiCaprio, uh, really putting Tom Hardy on the scene after some real box office bummers he'd had through the years. Remember he was in that shitty Star Trek movie? No, it's because no one does. But at the end of the day, what the movie really surprised everybody in Hollywood, and I think in general as well, was the, how successful this movie was straight away. Like, obviously, word of mouth. If a movie is good, people are going to talk about it, and they're all going to rush out and see the movie. But, like, opening weekend, people were there to see this movie. It was hugely successful. Whether it's from knowing him from the Dark Knight trilogy, whether the trailers were any good, I can't really remember. But in a rare instance, I think it was my own mother who said to me, let's go see this movie, Inception. It is very rare for my mother to not only know about a movie before I do, but to be actively interested in seeing something, to go out to the movie theaters and see it. Uh, if you're my mother, movies are cold, loud, and annoying. And you know what? She's right on all three counts. So Inception, great film. 
uh, great ideas, great building on Nolan's skills, especially with the intensity of the layers of the dreams. And especially if things go wrong in the dream, the idea of the dream is collapsing where everything just goes absolutely batshit insane. It's an engaging concept that is very complicated, but the movie never ever talks down to you. It's why I hate movies from people like Adam McKay or Mackay, however you want to pronounce his last name. He's the guy that's done movies like The Big Short or Vice or Don't Look Up Recently. What he does movies about are interesting and I do want to watch movies about them, but the way he directs them, the way he expects the audience to react to his ideas, it's like he thinks he's cleverer than everybody else or that everybody doesn't know what he's talking about because our minds are too focused on fast and furious movies and cheap shots he'll make at these people to be like, you don't understand the housing market. Uh, here's Margot Robbie in a tub because you that's that's what people care about. Uh, you, you don't understand Dick Cheney. You don't even know who Dick Cheney was because you were excited for the next fast and furious movie. Don't Look Up is about global warming. Do you get it? Do you? Do you get it? You probably don't because you're too busy tweeting. The stuff he talks about is important and the movies are important, but I don't like the way he tells stories. With Christopher Nolan, especially with Inception, with later stuff like Interstellar and Tenet, which get more and more ludicrous and bonkers, uh, you watch it though and you never feel like you should feel stupid for watching it. You do learn and understand as you go. With Inception, an incredibly complex, bonkers story with different aspects that are constantly going on that requires your full undivided attention, but rewards you for paying attention and understands that you will know what's going on as the movie's progressing. So you will have a good time and you'll feel pretty good about yourself as well. You won't feel like complete shit like I do when I watch an Adam McKay movie sometimes. So that was it, Inception incredible success story for Nolan and I guess that's what really proved that he could go away very secretly work on secret movies without much information given to the people producing funding him for any information to the public just create new brand ideas new concepts that he wanted to investigate whether it was the far reaches of space or using time as a weapon in and of itself but having the bare minimum when these movies are coming out when interstellar was coming out after this all people knew was it was the next christopher nolan movie it was going to be about space and matthew mcconaughey and hathaway there was a list of actors who were all going to be in it but i don't think until like the first trailer came out there was even like a synopsis of what the movie may or may not be about and even then it was vague but intriguing and sure enough, Interstellar, another success story for Christopher Nolan. Dunkirk even more so. And Tenet, while people didn't go back to the movies in droves like Hollywood expected them to, that's not a reflection on the anticipation for a Nolan film or his success. That's Hollywood not reading the global catastrophe that was probably going on at that point. I will be interested to see how Oppenheimer goes, especially going head-to-head -head with Barbie, which at the moment... People are going gaga for, even though you haven't even seen it yet. If you can hear something, now Ali's taking a shit. That's my other cat. Thanks guys, two for two. I love you. It's intriguing that for Nolan's next film, it is a biopic. One could argue that a biopic is the director's way of tackling the IP brand issue without directly addressing it. I'm not making a movie about your favorite comic book, but I'm making a movie about Oppenheimer. You know that name. You know about the atomic bond. So you bond. So you'll come and see the movie. In the same way, the new Ridley Scott film is about Napoleon. He's picked an historical figure that people are very familiar with. Maybe people will come and see that. So maybe biopics will become the new IP brand. I don't know. But I will be very interested to see how this goes for Nolan going forward. If he can recapture that success that he had with Inception and other Nolan films or if his time in the sun has passed or if Barbie's just going to take everything from everyone quite deservedly so and for the next six years we'll just get Barbie movies and you know what I might be okay with that 
thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, as I said, I'll be back next week to review very anticipated for me, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I don't know if it's going to be good. People hate Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I genuinely don't mind it. It's not as good as the other Indiana Jones movies by any means, but it's not bad enough that we should pretend that it doesn't exist, as some people that I know do. But apparently early reviews for Dial of Destiny range from mid to this is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. So... I don't know. It's directed by one of my favorite directors, James Mangold. Did Logan. Everyone loved Logan. So it really will be another example of that split between critic reaction and audience reaction. Or maybe everyone will be on the same page and think it's trash. I don't know, but I'm excited to find out and tell you what I think. But until then, uh, keep safe. Be kind to one another. I love and appreciate you as always. And I will see you on the next episode. You've been spliced in later. Adios, muchachos. I'll catch you next time.